I so appreciate a standing ovation for arriving on time. And uh, just how they greet you at work when you show up on time and it's a standing ovation, that great. Well, what a great welcome and thank you for being here, all of our 20 campuses and online. So thankful that uh, you would gather together in worship with us. If you have a Bible, we're gonna be looking at Matthew chapter nine. You can take it out or turn it on or you can follow along with us on the screen. Uh, I've actually, speaking of Bibles, I actually have, I, I preached here about two months ago and I accidentally stole Pastor Rick's Bible. And so I've actually been, taken his Bible all over the world, stole it. I've been using it, wondering if I get extra like power by using it. But I also learned you can find out a lot about a person by actually just looking at their Bible and how they use it, right? So, <laughs> um, so a couple of things here I found in, uh, you can find out a lot by what they mark, maybe uh, what they cross out. That's interesting right there, no. So you can actually, you know, or what's really good. No, no I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, uh, um, but, but that really was his Bible. I really did steal it ac accidentally. And, um, but, but we're going to, and I love some of the passages that are marked in and around mission about sharing Jesus with others. That's what I'm going to talk about today. And you remember, Pastor Rick started this series. And I'm going to conclude this series because we start a new series next week called The Doors to Your Destiny. But this series, we've gone through choosing the right values, choosing the right guide, the Holy Spirit. Choosing the right companions. He talks some about Billy Graham there, but about the companions we go on the journey with. Choosing the right doors, which is an introduction to our Easter series, which starts next week, which you do want to really encourage uh, your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers to come and to be part of. And then uh, this week, I'm talking about choosing to let God use you and bless you as you bless others on mission, right? So you choose to bless others on mission. So Rick asked me to talk about how God will bless you and use you and to exhort you to be specifically on mission this week as we lead up to Easter. Now, mission, of course, is one of the five purposes of the church, but it's also a key identity in your life. You are sent by Jesus on mission, and you choosing to let God use you will be an opportunity for God to bless you by joining Jesus on mission this week and every week. You've got to choose this week and every week to bless others on mission. Matthew 9 is going to help us to think more deeply about that. Now, a little bit of context here is that between uh, Matthew 9, 8 and 9 is kind of, a, kind of a transitional couple of chapters. In Matthew 5 through 7, we have the greatest sermon by the greatest teacher who ever lived. Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 10, we find Jesus sending his people, his disciples, out on mission. And so at that moment, we see Jesus as the sender of the people who are on mission. But Matthew 8 and 9 is kind of a transitional time, and Matthew's putting his uh, gospel together under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to teach us and to show us certain things. And here, between the Sermon on the Mount, which is all about kingdom living, how the kingdom of God has come into the world and how we would live as its citizens, so between kingdom living and kingdom mission is the passage where we find ourselves today. And our passage ends with a prayer. Let me read the passage so we can see the prayer, and then I'll explain why it matters. Beginning in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says this. It says, Then Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So this passage ends with a prayer. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. So remember, from kingdom living, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, the kingdom mission in Matthew 10, we get a reminder at the end of the transition of kingdom-focused prayer in Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus ends, uh, uh, Matthew ends this section with Jesus' prayer, encouraging us to intercessory prayer, to pray for workers to be sent into the harvest. So we're going to work backwards from that idea, from that prayer, because Matthew, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us some things about Jesus' ministry and about his compassion before he gets us to the prayer that he calls us to pray. So I, and you remember through the series, Pastor Rick has been talking about how the right values will give you the right future. And I'm talking today about choosing to let God use you and bless you 
this week and beyond to bless others on mission. So there are three things we're going to look at. We'll take it one at a time. And so let's begin. And as you came in, you received a, a worship guide, our, our program. And inside there, you'll actually be able to find a copy of our message notes. You have it at all of our campuses. And if you're watching online, it's just there right next to you for you to download as well. Let me encourage you to take it out, follow along with us as we go through this passage. So number one, you'll see in your notes and on the screen, it says to, we, have to, we need to be seeing the blessing of the kingdom. We gotta see the blessing of the kingdom. So Matthew wants to make clear that we understand what Jesus has come to do. And this week and beyond, as we bless others on mission, we need to be clear what Jesus has come to do. So in Matthew 9, 35, Jesus explains it to us again. And there's a reason I say again, I'll explain that in a minute. It says, Jesus went through, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness, Matthew 9, 35. Now, what we're finding here is this text. Remember, this is this whole section. In fact, in your Bible, like mine, it might indent this section because this is a section that Matthew's setting apart. And he's going to lead to this prayer, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest field. But he does so by reminding us the mission Jesus is on. He's resetting the story. He's resetting the section. You know why we know that is because this phrase is actually used elsewhere in the Gospel of Matthew. In fact, it's almost word for word, Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching, proclaiming, the kingdom of God and healing their diseases and sicknesses. So Jesus is going about teaching, preaching, and healing. And this is important because in Matthew 10, Jesus is going to say to them, you're going to do that. So this is a inc incredibly important transitional passage where we go from the disciples being the object of the ministry, he was teaching them, uh, he's preaching to them, to them, them being partners in the ministry where they would be sent on mission with the message of Jesus. And prayer is the bridge here, Matthew's leading us to the prayer. So this is not just about what Jesus is going and doing, though it is about that. It's how we're gonna be joining Jesus in that as the disciples did in Matthew chapter 10. But understanding the kingdom is the reminder that the king, Jesus, has come, and so the kingdom has come. It's already here, it's not yet fully here until Jesus comes back, but for now we're ambassadors, you and I, of the kingdom of God, and the prayer that Jesus is gonna tell us to pray, the Lord of the harvest, to send workers into his harvest, is begins with an understanding of the kingdom that he brought, that we become citizens of, and that we're ambassadors as well. But the reminder of the kingdom, we don't have time to fully unpack all that, but we know that Jesus actually tells us to, to pray, well, about the kingdom. We know this, even if you didn't go to church a lot, I, I, we went to church, we, we had a church when I was a kid growing up just outside of New York City, and, but it was kind of the church we didn't go to. I mean, if we had gone, we'd go there. And so we had a church that we went to on Christmas and Easter, uh, but we didn't go other times. And so, um, so I knew this prayer from that time, you might as well. It said this, right? Here's part of it. It's in Matthew 6, 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It's part of what we'd call the Lord's Prayer, but really was the disciples' model prayer that Jesus taught them. So he's calling us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Matthew's reminding us that he came preaching the good news of the kingdom, and now we're citizens of the kingdom, we're ambassadors of the kingdom, and in just a few verses we'll see how prayer drives us to action because it aligns our heart with God. Prayer we're gonna see at the end of this passage, focuses you on kingdom values. We're actually gonna pray what Jesus told us to pray at the end of this message today. Prayer focuses you on kingdom values. Why? Because choosing to let God use you and bless you reminds us and is essential that we say what Isaiah said. Okay, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, use me. And this week and beyond, I'm gonna ask you to bless others on mission. So number one, we looked at see the blessing of the kingdom. Jot this down. Number two, feel the compassion of Jesus. I want you to actually feel the depth of Jesus' compassion here. Now, if you have your notes there, you can actually already see the word compassion, or maybe you have your Bible there as well. Take a moment and circle the word compassion and put an exclamation point or a star near that circle. Here's why. Because in the original language that the New Testament was written, uh, this word doesn't translate well into English. 
It's because it's a deeper than just, you know, I feel compassion, right? Um, you know, because we might feel compassion for a myriad of issues, for a myriad of things. But here's what the Bible says, well, Matthew writes about Jesus. Actually, Matthew gives us a glimpse into the feelings of the Savior. Here's what he says. When he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion. And that compassion is stronger than our English word, but he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Three strong words in there in the original language. Compassion, harassed, and helpless are all three strong words, but compassion, perhaps the strongest. Matter of fact, it doesn't even technically translate well into English. Literally, it means to be moved, to be moved as to one's bowels, which doesn't translate well literally into English. So not in the way we mean today, right? So, so but I mean, you know, you could, this, this makes sense, right? To be moved in your inward parts, to, to literally have your, have your in, in, inner parts moved because you are so compassionate, you're hurting for somebody so deeply. It's a gut-wrenching, heart-melting, aching heart. So that's the heart that Jesus had for people who did not know him or follow him. That compassion is deep. We see a little reflection of that in the way Paul writes to the church at Philippi. He said, for God, in Philippians 1.8, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So, so it's an in-depth compassion, an affection that Jesus has, a desire that people would be, he's the good shepherd to, to be in the sheep. And that compassion for people who are who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd is so connected to who Jesus is, that it reminds us that we too are to be connected that way. Remember, Matthew is building us towards a prayer, and that prayer has a point. When we pray, we become like Jesus, feeling the depth of compassion for his mission and his people. When we pray, we see people for who they really are if they don't know Christ in desperate need of a good shepherd. Now, it's hard sometimes to think about that, you know, because you don't think of that level of compassion. I think of that, I've had that level of compassion in hard times, um, with my family, I think of the time my wife um, got got ill, and she's fine today. But I remember the time when we didn't know if she'd be fine. We we started dating when we were pretty young. We started dating when we were 15. I say we were 15. She actually says we started dating when we were 16, which technically means I was stalking her for a year and not actually knowing it. <laughs> the lack of awareness of my social cues might be something that became an issue later in our marriage. Uh, but I, I, I thought we were dating, and so she thought we were friends. And so, okay, well, <laughs> thanks for letting me know, like five years into our marriage, that you didn't know that. And, and so, so, uh, so we, got, we got married at, at 20. Um, don't, don't tell our daughters, but we got married at 20. And gosh, a few years into our marriage, she just got sick and one day uh, had, a, had a seizure and lost consciousness and and we didn't know, and we were, and, and, and I, I was, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on. She didn't know what was going on. The doctors couldn't give us an answer, and finally, the doctors just said, "We don't know." Sometimes it just happens when people get sick, and but I'm, I'm just like, I remember just being with her. Just my heart is just torn up. My insides are just torn apart. And I'm like, I, I want this to go away. I want this to be better. And, and, and it was, I know for some of you, you work, walk through deeper pain where it didn't get better. And I grieve with you, but, but I want you to think about the level of emotional gut punch, heart wrenching compassion that maybe you felt for a family member, a friend or somebody when they've hurt. Well, that's the kind of word that if we had a word to translate that into English, that the word compassion would be, it says that Jesus had compassion on them. Why? Not just because they were hurting, though for that, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, torn, some Bibles translated. They were torn apart and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's how Jesus feels about people who don't know him. And Matthew wants us to know that because he's leading us to a prayer about workers in the harvest to people who don't know him. His heart went out like a gut punch, a heart going out and more graphic words, torn and helpless, because he's the good shepherd. I mean, don't miss this, right? Look look at John chapter 10 about the good shepherd heart of Jesus. I'm the good shepherd, he says, and he self-identifies, he describes himself as the good shepherd. These matter. Next week, you're gonna hear about how, how, Pastor Rick's gonna explain how he describes himself as I am the door and how deeply that matters. Well, when Jesus says, I am something, we gotta pay attention. He says, I'm the good shepherd. Now, so just we know he's saying, I have come, he had compassion on them because 
because they were like sheep without a shepherd. But then he, we know he says, I am. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not a shepherd, does not own the sheep. When he she, sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. See, there's a link here between prayer and compassion. Remember, Matthew's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to bring us to a prayer where he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. But if we just start praying to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest, and we don't understand the message of the kingdom and the heart of compassion, we'll pray without the understanding and the background that Matthew desired for us to have. This is important in a minute. Because Jesus frequently prayed and came back from prayer. He saw people searching for him. And here's how he responded. Matthew 14, 14. He had Jesus. It says he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Prayer pushes you towards compassion. Matthew is writing in such a way that you would see this and be burdened with compassion as Jesus was burdened with compassion for people who did not know him. Prayer pushes you towards compassion. Matter of fact, compassion really is so identifying uh, with the needs of others that you must act. So Jesus acted, right? He died on the cross for our sin and in our place. He's the good shepherd, so Good Friday is good because the good shepherd died in our place for our sin on that cross. So that message might spread. And it's interesting because in the next chapter, he begins to spread that message. He says to his disciples, uh, I'm going to send you out. He says he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, evil, evil, evil disease, and sickness. So they came from being the objects of Jesus' teaching to now being partners in Jesus' teaching. And 2,000 years later, we have to move from being the objects of the teaching to the partners in the teaching. Now, the reality is, is that, I mean, all of us are here who are followers of Jesus. All of us are here because somebody told us about Jesus. It might have been in an Easter service at Saddleback. It might have been a friend who shared. For me, it was a volunteer youth leader who shared the gospel with me as a young member uh, of the youth group, an unchurched kid who, 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 who was kind of pushed to go into church by a mom who had recently heard the gospel and seen her life changed. And then this volunteer youth leader spoke into my life, and I heard the good news of the gospel, and followed Jesus. But you know, somebody told that volunteer youth leader about Jesus, and someone told that person about Jesus, and someone told that person about Jesus, all the way back to this moment here. So we're literally at the end. Your life, your church is at the end of a Great Commission highway. Your life is at the end of a Great Commission highway. I don't want you to miss this, because I'm asking you not to let your life be a cul-de-sac on that Great Commission highway. I'm asking your life not to be a dead end on that Great Commission highway. Because the reality is, for a lot of people, it is. Now, why do you say, how do you know that? Well, we've done some research on it. So about a year and a half ago, I went to where I serve now. I, I serve as the executive director of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College in Chicagoland. And, uh, but before that, I was the head of research at an organization called Lifeway Research. And so we actually asked a sample several thousand in three languages here in the, uh, in the U.S. This study was actually U.S. and Canada. And what we asked them was um, a series of questions to agree or disagree. Let me show you a few of them. We asked them to agree or disagree. You can see the answers. I have a personal responsibility to share my religious beliefs about Jesus Christ with non-Christians. Now, these are churchgoers. We're asking Protestant churchgoers. Now, you might word the question differently. Everybody would, but not everyone uses the language in the same way we do. So we said, to share my religious beliefs about Jesus with non-Christians. You can see there that strongly agree is 55%. Somewhat agree is 24%. I really want to know what church you're going to where you're among the 3% who disagree strongly. <laughs> I don't know what Bible you're reading. Um, maybe that's in Second Opinions, chapter 4, verse 11. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure... You're doing it wrong. Um, but the reality is what we find is we, overwhelmingly people who attend church believe they 
have a responsibility to share the gospel, right? So that's 79%. In research, we tend to collapse, agree strongly, and agree somewhat. So that's actually 79%. That's a, that's a strong number. We'd be very happy to see 79%. So of course, if that's true, that means that all the people who are going to church must be telling all their friends about Jesus, right? I mean, you're seeing conversations every day around the water cooler at work. You're seeing neighbors carrying their Bibles to neighbors, right? You're seeing family members. That's happening, right? Not so much. Um, I'm, that's why Pastor Rick just a few weeks ago occurred just to come out as Christians, to say and to speak up and to be unapologetic of saying, I've been changed by Jesus. He's come into my heart, changed my life. I've received by grace and through faith the good news of the gospel. This number says that everyone should be doing that. I mean, if they think they should, have a personal responsibility, but maybe they just don't think they know how. Well, maybe they're not comfortable. So we asked them that question, right? So we asked among Protestant churchgoers, I feel comfortable that I can share my belief in Christ with someone else effectively. Now, the strongly agrees go down here. It's 31%. The somewhat agrees go up to 43%. But in research, we collapse those categories to agree. Here's why. Because some people will just never strongly agree with anything. They're just like, oh, I don't know. But what we find is somewhere between, so 79% of people feel that they, they agree somewhat or strongly that they have a responsibility. 79% of people agree they should share their faith. 74% of people say they feel comfortable sharing their faith. And yet it seems to me there's not a whole lot of people sharing their faith. Again, Christians love evangelism as long as somebody else is doing it. But we're called ultimately to be ambassadors. Why? Because the king has come and the kingdom has come. We need to tell them about the king. Because we want to align with his compassion, the depth of his compassion for people who don't know Jesus. You say, Ed, are they inviting friends to church? Maybe they're doing it personally. Well, we actually asked that question. We asked among Protestant churchgoers, how many times, in the specific question, in the past six months, about how many times have you personally shared with someone how to become a Christian? The most common answer, 61%, was zero. So the most common response is Zero. Second is 16%. Let me tell you something as someone who's been a professional researcher and done polls and been a pollster. Uh, people, by the time they get into a survey, they sort of know that this is a survey about sharing your faith among other things. And so what people tend to do is they want to answer in such a way that they, they look better, right? They want to answer in such a way they wish it were true, right? So, so what you would expect is, is that you're surveying Christians who attend churches. They're going to kind of round up a lot their responses, now, we have a technical word for that. The technical word for that is lying. <laughs> it's not really. It's called the halo effect is what it's actually called. That's a real phrase. And so, so they actually want to answer in a way that they think is the right answer. So probably this is a rosy picture of how often people are sharing the gospel. And the answer is not much at all. You say, well, maybe, Ed, they're inviting their friends to church. Well, I say, well, let's, great. Let's see. Among Protestant churchgoers, have you invited an unchurched person to attend a church service or some other program at your church in the past six months? Uh, about half said zero. I want you to miss this, right? These are people who go to church. And in the last six months, the most common answer is, I've invited nobody. Well, what I want you to know is that this is the opportunity this week, like no other time this year, to invite your friends to church, to move those statistical numbers. Now, I know Saddleback would be better than that. But why, why do we not share if we know we should? Here's part of why I think it is and why Matthew is taking us through the text in this way. I think we don't share like we should because we don't hurt enough for the lost, people who don't know Jesus. I'll give you an example. So my father's not a Christian. And when I say he's not a Christian, I don't mean he's like in a denomination that I don't like, so I don't count him. <laughs> that's a thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but that's a thing. Um, my dad doesn't believe he needs to receive by grace and through faith the good news of the gospel. I've shared it with him dozens of times. I love my dad deeply. I share the gospel with my dad because I love my dad. Can I tell you, it is not easy to share the gospel with your father because your father knows all you're stupid, <laughs> right? Your father, when you were a teenager, found your stash. I mean, this is not somebody. I mean, your dad knows the dumb stuff. But I, my heart is deeply burdened that my dad would know Jesus so that he might respond to the good news of the gospel so that he might spend eternity with the Lord. I am deeply burdened and my heart is filled with compassion for my dad. And I don't get over that because it then goes to my neighbors and goes to my friends because people need Jesus. 
So it's not too late to pray like Jesus is about to tell us to pray. The Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest. It's not too late to pray for somebody specifically. This week is a wonderful week for this. This week and beyond, bless others on mission. Number three in our outline, I wanna encourage you to pray and be used of God. Pray and be used of God. Pastor Rick talked about the importance of choices throughout this series, how changing our values can give us the future we want, submitted to the Lordship of Christ, following him. I want your future shaped by Jesus' mission, one of the purposes of the church, but a key purpose in your life. Then you'll be blessed and you'll bless others. And this week and beyond, you can bless others on mission. Let's look at Matthew chapter nine, verse 37 and 38. This is the prayer part. This is the part that Jesus tells us to do. Then he, that's Jesus, said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, it's interesting. So he says, ask the Lord of the harvest. Now, I know that if you were a kid growing up in church, I didn't have that privilege, but if you're a kid growing up in church, you know the answer to the question the teacher asked was always Jesus, right? So someone would say something. I remember one little kid saying, I, I think the answer is a squirrel, but the answer is always Jesus. <laughs> and so, so let me just ask you, and that's the right answer. Who is the Lord of the harvest? Jesus. Correct. So Jesus is saying, ask the Lord of the harvest, right him, therefore to send out workers into his harvest field. Now what you know, that maybe the first readers of Matthew didn't know, is that in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends them as workers into the harvest field. So it's sort of like Jesus is saying, ask the Lord of the harvest, that's me, to send out workers, that's you into the harvest, that's them. Because in the next chapter, that's what he does. So Jesus tells them to pray and tells us to pray 2,000 years later for the harvest. Do people, do they pray earnestly? It just speaks of some of the depth in a, tradition, a more traditional Bible translation, how explained in English, how to pray earnestly for the harvest. Well, we actually did a study. So. Um, Max Lucado was writing a book on prayer. So you've heard of Max Lucado, an author and a pastor, and he was doing a book on prayer, and he contracted with our research team to do research on that at Lifeway Research. And here's, so they asked us, have you ever prayed for? Right, so these are some things we asked me. Have you ever prayed for? Take a look. Uh, people who mistreat you, 41%. Your enemies, 37%. Winning the lottery, 21%, <laughs> right? I'm, neither, I'm not endorsing that one. Um, but I do want you to remember that number. We'll get back to that in just a minute. Success into something you put almost no effort into, which I describe as the entirety of my high school. <laughs> Lord, help me through this test, though I did no studying for it. Um, God to avenge people, your favorite team to win, right? Your favorite team to win. I live in, I live in Chicago, and so we, uh, we are, uh, Loyola has gone, but very, very, I don't know anything about sports, but I understand there's some sort of World Series going on right now related to some sport with a big, bigger bas basketball, that's what it is. And so I happen to know Chicago's like now made it into this, this, this uh, playoffs or something, the World Series or something, and, but there's a lot of praying going on in Chicago. There's this, there's this sister Jean or somebody, a lot of people are praying with her. I don't know anything about that, but I've seen this on news a lot. Um, have you prayed for finding a good parking spot? If not, you will next week when you come to Easter <laughs> services. You know, Lord, find me a spot. Um, how about not getting caught speeding? Uh, I've prayed that. Matter of fact, I've prayed that in very key moments involving lights behind me. Um, Matter of fact, I haven't gotten a ticket in, I don't even know, uh, 15, 20 years. I mean, I've gotten a ticket. I have to confess to you, I've gotten a ticket. And, and so, so I, but not in a long, long time. So I moved to Chicago. I'm not really used to the roads. And I become the interim teaching pastor at a church in downtown Chicago called Moody Church. And so I, I preach there three or four Sundays. And I'm here other places at, at other Sundays. And so I'm going down there, but I'm not familiar with the way. And so I went a little faster than I should. And so um, one of Chicago's finest uh, lit me up and uh, pulled me over. And so I'm really trying to debate what to do at this point. I don't wanna be late for church, but because then I gotta to explain to the church why I'm late. So what do you do? I mean, so I had, I had my Bible. It wasn't Rick Warren's Bible. That would've gotten me out of stuff, but I had my Bible and I would've, so I, I thought, I think I could take my Bible and put it on the dashboard, right? 
I mean, not like open it, like praise the Lord, brother. Not in a creepy way, maybe a little bit of creepy, but I could put my Bible up there and say, I'm so sorry, I was rushing to church to serve the Lord. But that could have gone, that could have gone, he could have said, praise God, brother. And I mean, I had this, I had this like fantasy in my mind. He was going to say, praise the Lord. Let me go ahead of you. I'll put on my lights and the sirens and we'll get you there. We'll get you there. And that was not going to happen, I assure you. Um, or I could put it up there and he'd say, yeah, sure. Um, but, uh, but I prayed and I got a warning rather than a ticket. So let me just say, God does answer on that day, that prayer. But maybe you've prayed for not getting caught speeding. Let me, just, let me just say, just since I know people watch this around the world, don't speed. I'm not endorsing. I got in trouble. Don't do that. But I told you to remember the 21% number. I want you to remember the winning the lottery number. Not so you can play that number. Um, I want you to remember that number for a point in a minute. Hold on to it. Because um, we asked that question was, what have you ever prayed for? Well, let me ask the question, what do you typically pray for? And here's some things that people said they typically prayed for, family or friends. That's great. My own problems or difficulties. I pray for that. You do too, probably. My own sin. Thank God 42% of people may be confessing their sin. Um, God's greatness, 37%. That could be great. People praising God for who he is. Um, 20%, you'll see there, said they pray for people of other faiths or no faith, which, which I, think is, I think is significant, worth noting. But, um, but, but, but what I want you not to miss is this, right? So 20% of people pray for people of other faith or no faith. Don't miss that. But here's what I want you not to miss. Jesus tells us at a tree, key transitional point in the Gospel of Matthew to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest, but more people say they pray to win the lottery than normally pray to win the lost. Now, that's a troubling statistic. So back to our passage. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus said, and 2,000 years later, it's still true. There are people this week who are more open than any other time of the year. If you will go into that harvest field, if you'll say, here I am, Lord, send me, the harvest is plentiful. But the workers are still few. Pray, as ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into his harvest field. Now keep in mind where this is, to remind you again, this is between kingdom living and kingdom mission. And sometimes the worker in the harvest is you. You might be a worker in a harvest that somebody else is praying for because that's exactly what happened to the disciples. That right after this, in chapter 10, Jesus sends them. Literally, that's the headline of the next section. Jesus sends them into the harvest field. They go from being those who receive Jesus' message to those who share it. He's about to send them on mission, and he wants them to pray for people on mission. Now, now, why it's, it's interesting because I can imagine Jesus sort of talking to them, and it reminds me of a scene with uh, my own daughter. I have three daughters. I think I've told you, I've had, last time I was here, I told you I have three daughters, which is, which is both a statement of reality and a prayer request as the father of three daughters. <laughs> Matter of fact, all three of them right now are teenagers, so that's a statement of prayer and fasting as well. <laughs> and they're awesome. I love my daughters. And my middle daughter, her name's Jacqueline, and she is the, the one who is most like me. You know, the Lord sometimes gives you a child who's most like you as an opportunity for your sanctification, <laughs> and like a mirror so you can see all the things that you didn't realize you were doing. So Jacqueline's a lot like me, even looks like me to some degree. If you slapped a goatee on her, you'd think it's me, <laughs> but in a beautiful way. Um, now, I'm going to share an illustration with you. I want you to know that people, whenever I share an illustration about the kids, someone will write me and say, you shouldn't have shared an illustration about your kids. I want you to know my kids know that I share illustrations about them, and I clear the illustrations with them beforehand. And by clear, I mean pay beforehand. <laughs> so we negotiate a fee depending upon the illustration, its level of embarrassment. And some illustrations have cost me a lot of money. This one has not. So my daughter, like me at 15 years of age, does not know what the expression clean your room means. Her room is a consistent disaster, much like my room was when I was 15. Now I'm sure you're a better parent than we are and I understand that, but the other two daughters, we've raised them the same and they have clean rooms. And so we don't know what happened with this middle daughter except that she is me. <laughs> so I remember walking up to her room one day kind of pushing through the debris and saying, man, kids should be able to clean their rooms. 
Now, now it's interesting. When I went up to say there, Jacqueline was with me, I, I actually was not talking about other people. So he said, kids should really clean their rooms. Jacqueline was not like, yeah, those people. I mean, they really should clean their room. <laughs> she knew I was talking about her. Now, I want you not to miss this. Because when Jesus stood up before his disciples and said to them, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field, they knew he was talking about them because the very next thing he did was send them into the harvest field. So Matthew leads us through the kingdom of God, through the compassion of Jesus, to praying for the harvest. What's going on here is that you know, we also are the laborers. Sometimes the worker in the harvest that you pray for, and the answer is you. The disciples are instructed to pray, and then the very next verse to fulfill that prayer. And that's you. Now, here we are on Palm Sunday. I've told you several times that between Palm Sunday and Easter is the most open time that people have. And, and praise God for that. But let me also tell you that a lot of times around here at Saddleback, we say that the first service was on Easter. And over 200 people came to the first service at Saddleback, and we talk about it being on Easter. But that's not completely technically accurate. There was a service the week before. It was a practice service, but it was a public service. And, and actually, just a few dozen people prayed and gathered there and, and worshiped there. People came to Christ in that practice service, right? But those few dozen people, I mean, there were bailers that went out the next week and more, but those few dozen people said on Palm Sunday, we are going to invite everybody we know. We're going to invite them all to Easter. We're going to see this as an opportunity to share and show the love of Jesus. We're going to make it our business to go into our heart harvest field. We're going to be the workers in the harvest and invite everybody that we can on Easter. And now, a few decades later, there's a few more of us here on Palm Sunday. But you know, we can have that same vision, that same passion that they had on Palm Sunday this week. Now, I've got convicted of this in my own life, right? This week and beyond, you can bless others on mission, but I got convicted of this in my own life and Don and I were living in Nashville at the time. Our kids were a little younger, and we decided that the Lord would have us be more intentional engaging our neighbors in our harvest field. So we actually took a sheet of paper and drew a map. And we drew a map, and it's not as fancy as this map that we've printed for you, but we just drew a map. And on that map, we kind of marked out where our, where our home was. And so we, we would live here. And, and so there's, there's, you know, there's where we live, and that's our family and, and, uh, and our little dogs. And, uh, you know, it's... And so then we said, okay, well, let's, let's map out our, our neighbors in our neighborhood. And so we began to kind of put uh, the houses where they were and, and to kind of explain, because we wanted to really, we asked the Lord to allow us to share the gospel with uh, eight of our neighbors, right? To intentionally share the gospel with eight neighbors. And so who didn't know the Lord? Now, some of these people did know the Lord, and so, so you'll notice there's more than eight that are necessarily listed here. But we, well, we did, you know, for example, these, uh, these neighbors here were Christians. And so, so we began walking through this process of sharing the gospel, and we shared the gospel with, with seven out of eight of our neighbors. Now, you may say, Ed, why didn't you share the gospel with eight out of eight of your neighbors? Well, to be perfectly honest, these people really didn't like us. I'm still working through that, as you might be able to tell, because what they didn't like was they didn't like my kids. It doesn't like my kids, but every neighborhood needs a get off my lawn neighbor, and those were our neighbors. Now, we still invited them to church every Easter. We invited them to church every Christmas Eve, but we didn't have the opportunity to sit down and share the good news of the gospel with them. But we did for others, and it doesn't mean everybody responded. So, for example, this, these family were, this family were believers, and, but these, these family, uh, this family here, we began to share the gospel with them, and eventually uh, both the husband and the wife trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, and they were baptized and became leaders in our church. And, and we said, well, let's start a Bible study. So we actually started a Bible study in their home, and, and these folks came to the Bible study. And she was a believer, but he wasn't. But he became a believer, and they didn't end up at our church. This family ended up at our church, became leaders in our church, but they ended up at a different church in town that loves the Bible and loves the gospel, and, and we thank God for what's going on there. And, but not everybody responded. Um, you know, she said no. She said that she found us too narrow-minded and too, um, too out of step with the times, and, but she still come to church on Easter. You'd be shocked at who will come on Easter that wouldn't come some other time. 
had the privilege of sharing with this family, and they, they still occasionally visit, and I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with them, or going through here, just spending time praying with them and sharing the gospel with them. And, and, uh, and this family here, actually, um, I had the privilege of baptizing both of them, and they later became missionaries to Brazil. So the lesson is, don't live in my neighborhood, it appears. Uh, but you know, I wasn't a pastor. I was the vice president of a company called Lifeway. And so I did this uh, not because I was a pastor. I did this because I love Jesus. And I want you to join me in having the same kind of passion for your neighborhood. Here's the thing. Pastor Rick last week asked you to turn in cards so he could pray for your neighbor's friends and family to invite them to church. Thank God for a pastor who loves people so much that he wants unchurched people who don't know Jesus to hear the gospel. But we need a whole church full of people who are going to map out their harvest field and begin to pray for these people by name, these people by name, these people by name. This is what it looks like to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest and then to respond, here I am, Lord, send me. So so I'm asking you to make make a map. And this isn't something that I'm just putting up on the screen. Inside your worship guide, you'll actually find a sheet of paper to make your map. And on the back of it, what you'll also notice is a list because not everyone's gonna be in your neighborhood that you'll have the opportunity to share the gospel with, but you're gonna have friends and family members, others. And so, you know, I thank God for for friends and family members. I, I, you know, you might put down, I'm praying for my dad. Maybe maybe you're praying for your postal worker. Uh, Maybe you're praying for whatever, but put their names, right? So put their names and pray for them. And then as you pray for them, say, I'm praying, and then pray again, and then pray again, and then engage them, serve them, love them, and then invite them. And you can start this week by inviting them to what will be a service that could be the place where their lives are changed when they hear that Jesus is the door. You've heard the doors to your destiny as our Easter series, and so many of you have heard the gospel at one of our campuses the first time on Easter. And I, and I want you to also hear this too. Your church is not really normal. I know that sometimes when you go to a church, you sort of think your church is, this is what it's normally like to go to a church. You know, I've, I've, again, I've been a researcher. I've got tens of thousands of files on churches and we've got a, a, like a special label on just a few of them. Yours has this label. It's called freakishly abnormal. That's you. <laughs> but in a good way. Because of what God has done. I mean, more people have been baptized by believers baptism here probably than, than any church in history. But wouldn't it not be a fully honoring to the Lord and that which is next, exceeding beyond all that we could ask or think, if when we have a pastor who literally has a stack of thousands of names that he's praying for by name, if you could then join and actually say, here I am, Lord, send me. That's what Isaiah said. Here I am, Lord, send me. This is my harvest field, and I'm going to this week and beyond bless others on mission. That wouldn't surprise us. Thank God for a pastor who prays that way, but... I mean, you know, Jesus says, come follow me in Matthew 4, 19, and I will send you out to fish for people, your neighborhood. Now, your neighborhood may be different. Where we are in downtown Chicago at Moody Church, a lot of our people live in high rises. Maybe you live in a condo. Maybe you live in a rural area. But all of us have people within proximity, and maybe some of them are frustrating to you as they were to me, and I had a little fun, but built some relationship while we were there. You know, why would you do that? You know, (laughs) Jesus puts it this way. He says, as the Father has sent me, John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. See, I promise you that every time you pray this prayer, God will respond someplace, somewhere. You're sent in the world because you'll be part of that answer. So as you pray for the Lord to send laborers into his harvest field and you go into that harvest field, you're part of the answer to that prayer. It's interesting, one more stat before we go. We, in the study I mentioned earlier we did with Max Lucado, we asked him, we asked Americans who pray if their prayers were answered. 25% have said all of their prayers are answered. I'm like, sign me up for that team. <laughs> I don't think about it. I think they probably mean sometimes God says no, sometimes God says wait. We've heard that teaching before, and it's an appropriate one. But I want to be among those whose prayers are consistently answered. And yes, right, that's answer. When we pray, Lord, send laborers into your harvest field, and then we say, here I am, Lord, send me, and I go into my harvest field, then I'm the answer to the prayer in part, but God's also working in other places. I shared the gospel with a woman two weeks ago who then came to church because I said I was ordering her some books to talk more. She wasn't a believer, but she told me, She'd gone and walked away. She had a bad experience with Christianity when she was younger, was exploring uh, gurus and sacred scriptures of other religions. And I said, would you be open to considering Christianity? 
And she said she would, and she showed up at church, not thereafter. And then she told me that her mom was praying for her. I want you to miss this, right? So her mom was praying for her, and I wonder if her mom was praying that the Lord would send workers into his harvest field. And her mom lives in another country, but she's still been praying for her. And then I happen to be the worker in that harvest field, and somebody who is praying and somebody who is telling God is using both for his glory and his purposes. And I don't want you to miss this, right? I told you I'm praying for my dad. He told me recently that, and he's got a new Christian friend that's moved in down the street. Right? We got people everywhere. So next week, I really wanna encourage you this whole week to prioritize the harvest field. Pastor Rick's talked about those doors that'll be at all of our campuses, right? And, and that Easter prayer covenant that he's made with you to pray, he's got an Easter prayer covenant to pray for your friends. Can I ask you to have an ongoing, not just one week, but an ongoing prayer and harvest covenant as well? See, Easter prayer covenant was Rick's cards. Now I want you to have your card. I'm actually asking, would you ever just take this out? All of our campuses, if you're online, it's available by download. But take this out and just hold it up for just a second. It's not, it's not the palm frond you, wrote, you waved around a minute ago. Just wave this at me for just a second. All of our campuses, right? I can see you around the world at our campuses, right? Wave that around. So hold that in your hand now. You can, right, just hold it right here. Just hold it right here. Because I'm asking you to take a map, make a map, and make a list. Now some of you are gonna say, I don't like to do that. You're saying, hey, that's not the way I want to do it. And here's what I would say to you. I would say to you, if you are sharing the gospel with your neighbors and you got your own plan, I think that's great. But the church where I serve as interim um, was founded by someone named D.L. Moody. And he was once approached by someone who didn't like, said, I don't like the way you do evangelism, Mr. Moody. And he responded, I like the way I do evangelism better than the way you don't do evangelism. Do you got a better way? I think that's great. But if you don't have a better way, and statistics show that most people don't, and maybe maybe it sounds like they're probably higher numbers, but I'm asking you to join me. I literally carry in my own Bible a map and a list of my neighbors right now and coworkers and friends that I'm seeking to share the gospel with. And I want to ask you to consider doing the very thing. Take a map and a list and let's do this. Say, Ed, I can't think of anybody to pray for. You can't think of anyone else to pray for? You put Ed Stetzer's dad on your list and you pray for my dad. I'll take those prayers. He's still here and there's still time. And there's still time for you because prayer focuses you on the values of the Great Commission. This week and beyond, you can bless others on mission. I wanna ask you to walk through the doors that God will open this week, maybe to reach out to some neighbors and to some friends and bless others on mission this week and beyond. I'm asking you not to just take this as a one week enterprise. So this is your ongoing map. This is your ongoing list, because they might all not show up on Easter, but as you keep praying, you keep engaging, and you keep inviting, the openness will come. Now, we can't really end this message without doing exactly what Jesus told us to do. He literally told us this. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I don't want us to end our message without doing the very thing that the Lord wants us to do. But I also want to remind you that right here is the transition. The next chapter, Jesus said, you're the workers in the harvest. By his actions and by his direction, you're the workers in the harvest. There's a famous line in the book of Isaiah that Isaiah said. It goes like this, here I am, Lord, send me. I'd like you to say that out loud with me, if you don't mind, all of our campuses and online. It's here I am, Lord, send me. Say it with me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Because that's what Isaiah said. That's a consistent theme throughout the Bible. People say, here I am, Lord, send me. So as we pray, I'm gonna ask you to pray. But while we pray, I'm gonna ask you to keep that, keep that, that, that map right there in your hand. Just keep that list right, 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 right there. Hold on to it. And then I wanna pray. I'm gonna ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest. And then we're gonna say, here I am, Lord, send me. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we acknowledge today that you are indeed the one who sent us on mission for your namesake. Father, I thank you that somebody told me about Jesus and someone told them about Jesus and someone told them about Jesus. And Father, I pray that all across our campuses that we would all commit to not be a dead end or a cul-de-sac on the Great Commission Highway. As someone told us, may we tell others who tell others. Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed, would you make that your commitment right now? You've got maybe this map and this list in your hand. If you're watching online, you can download it. But would you just say, Lord Jesus, I need to reach my neighbors. I need to make a list of my friends and coworkers who aren't my neighbors, my family members. I'm asking you right now between you and the Lord to consider committing, making a map and making a list. I'm gonna boldly ask. You say, Ed, I, got, I wanna do it differently. Great, as long as you're doing it. Would you do that? Just between you and the Lord. Because right now I want you to think about your neighbors. 
Can you have the compassion on them that Jesus had for people who didn't know him, like sheep without a shepherd? Can you see the need they have to hear and see the message of the kingdom that Matthew reminds us Jesus preached? So if so, maybe you can take a tangible effort sometime today, maybe before you leave today, people came up to me after other services, already drawn a map to say, Lord Jesus, I wanna go to this mission field. Here I am, Lord, send me. Just think for just a moment who the Lord might lay in your heart to invite this week. Maybe friends and neighbors and coworkers, maybe someone you, you asked Pastor Rick to pray for, but now you gotta pray for and engage and invite. It takes just a moment. Just let their faces come before your mind's eye and say, Lord Jesus, give me boldness. Here I am, Lord, send me. Father, we hear the words of Jesus that the harvest is plentiful. Would you remind us there are people around us who are open, Lord? Father, would you put in our hearts and the prompting of your Holy Spirit the reminder that people around, the harvest is indeed plentiful. And would you convict us that the workers are few? And so, Lord, we do, as Jesus said, we ask you, Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers out into your harvest field and we pray, here I am, Lord, send me. Would you just pray that with me? Make it your prayer. Just repeat it with me. Let's pray it to the Lord together. Here I am, Lord, send me. Let's say it again. Thinking of our neighbors, you got your map in your hand, your list in your hand, you may fill it out later. With that in your hand, say, say with me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Father, I thank you that on a Palm Sunday decades ago, a few dozen people gathered at Saddleback and then just said, here I am, Lord, send me. Maybe they didn't have a map, maybe they didn't have a list, but they had a compassion and a desire to see your kingdom advanced. And I pray you'd burden us once again, this moment, this week and beyond, so that we might join you on mission. And we might indeed say, here I am, Lord, send me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day-to-day. -to, -day. to take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.